Hello, good evening, and welcome, Goodman Games fans, to another episode of The Scrivenery, where we dig into third-party publication. I am Ed Stanick, one of your hosts, and here's my co-host, Trevor. Hi, guys. I'm Trevor Stamper, co-host of The Scrivenery. Um, and, uh, you know, let me just start off, Ed, by saying that um, that I think this is going to be an interesting episode. We're going to talk about game balance. But first, uh, you know, if you don't mind, let me take a couple minutes and talk about GameholeCon, because I just Absolutely. got back from it. So, uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Wisconsin is is you know home to many good gaming conventions. Uh, Gary Con happens in the spring in March, and Game Hole Con is another major one, which is over in Madison, Wisconsin, and that happens in October. Um, it was about two weeks ago, actually. I would I would I was there two weeks ago, um, and so and we didn't have a we didn't have a scrivener because of it because I was gone. Sorry about that. Um, I was off gaming, so. <laughs> Um, so Game Hole Con is, uh, you know, I got in on the Wednesday, I left on the Sunday, I, I didn't participate in anything on Sunday because um, I had some friends fly in from Texas and they needed to leave the airport early. So we just planned on basically up and leaving Sunday morning. And that was good because it's it's an eight and a half hour drive for me. So it gets me home and a time shift back. So, you know, it really takes like, I get there an hour later than I would normally get to some place. And so, um, so, you know, it takes me a while to get home. Um, but game hole con was great. Uh, Goodman games was there in earnest. Uh, Joseph Goodman himself was there, which was great to see him kind of wandering around the halls and talking to people. And clearly he was, um, setting things up and, and, and doing lots of hobnobbing and stuff. Um, there were a lot of third party publishers there. Uh, Nick Barron from uh, breaker press game games was there. Obviously I was there to represent my, uh, myself and, um, <clears throat> Blind Visionary Publications. Um, who else did I see there? Um, gosh, you know, Levi Combs, who's been on the show before, was there from uh, um, XP. What is it? Planet X Games? Is that what it is? I can't remember off the top of my head. Sorry, guys. I saw Lu Lu there um, and, uh, and several other third-party publishers. So there was just a host of DCC going on, um, all of which sold out, I'm pretty sure, within the first hour or two or week of game hole con going live for registration and everything. So all the games were packed. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, what I spent most of my time doing there was play testing. So I've been working on a new setting earth crawl, uh, which will so come out sometime next year. Um, and, uh, and so I was, um, I was running a funnel for that. It's called scrap metal. So I got lots of uh, play test time in uh, three sessions with, uh, with five different players. I got to meet a lot of my, Kickstarter backers for the first time. That was kind of cool. And, uh, and so I got lots of feedback on what I was doing for that adventure and everything. And, um, and so that kind of ties in nicely with, with uh, what's going on, what we're going to talk about today in terms of game balance. The other thing that uh, Game Hole Con was great for was um, just kind of getting to know other zine publishers. There was a big zine presence um, and so Goodman Games had zines on display. There was a ton of air, you know, there were a lot of third party publishers that were on display, which was really nice. They had an expanded booth, Noble Knight Games, which is, I'm pretty sure the largest game, uh, used game company in, the United, in North America right now. Um, they're right there in Madison. So you could go on their website. This is really cool, actually. You can go on their website and for both GaryCon or GameholeCon, they're present at the convention and you can ask to look at a product and they will deliver it to the convention hall. And then you can walk up and say, Hey, my name is Trevor. And I asked you to, to bring these two products over. Can I look at them? Do, do you have them yet? And uh, cause they have three big warehouses. And so they'll, they'll deliver them to the convention hall. And then I got to look at them. So I actually purchased two zines, two British zines from the seventies, uh, 78 and 79. I think it was, uh, nice. they, they were called, um, it, there was a zine, called the beholder and um and so i have about six issues six or seven issues now i bought two issues while i was there and and it's really interesting to look at old zines and old publications these guys they were like 30 pence which would be today's equivalent into in in in, in if if it was 30 pence today it would be like a 50 cent or a 60 cent publication <laughs> which is which is no way i mean they were literally just running it off a of mimeograph paper <laughs> um, and, and everything, but there's some really great stuff in there. There were monsters that these guys had put together. Um, every, both issues had adventures. They had special things in them and stuff. And so they were really great to look at 
and uh, and they cause me to reflect. The reason I buy them and collect them is is they're good for me to reflect on what I'm doing in terms of zine publications. Um, and they're really hard to get a hold of, right? I mean, most of the pr print runs on these were less than 50 to 100 copies. Uh, and so for something to actually be in Madison, Wisconsin, in the United States, you know, 50 years after it was published or 45 years after it was published, um, when only 50 of them were produced is kind of kind of hard to come by. So, so Game Hole Con was a lot of fun. Um, I got to spend a lot of time looking at zines, looking at publications, playtesting my own stuff talking to other publishers. Uh, I got to stop and talk to Lou Alu a couple times, which was always great. Um, I met the gentleman who runs or who produced um, Neon Lords of the Toxic Wasteland, I think it's called. That was cool. Uh, Independent Publishers Union was there. So uh, Skeeter Green and Jim Wampler and um, uh, Jeffrey Talanian and stuff was there as well. So there was lots of people to talk to. And, uh, and so, and then you got to hang out in the evenings and everything. So that was great too. So, so overall, it was a great convention. I had a really good time. I, uh, I got some excellent feedback from everybody. So if anybody's listening who happened to be in one of my games, thank you so much for your feedback. We, uh, we took notes and I've already made corrections. So, uh, so that's great. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, speaking of publishing, is there anything on Goodman Games website about publishing for third parties? Why, why yes. Yes, there, there is. is. <laughs> now that you mention it so um yeah there's actually a uh landing page a, yeah a landing page uh that the um on on the goodman games website that that uh, does a couple of things on the one hand it will direct you to third-party publications that goodman games sells on their website uh, and there are quite a few. There is a wide variety. If I had to spitball, I'd say probably somewhere on the order of 30 or so third party publishers. And that's just a wild guess uh, that are represented in terms of products sold on their website. <clears throat> and um, yeah, let me drop that. I just, I just sent you that link. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then. Uh, they also have, uh, of course, a link to the, yeah, no problem, a, uh, to our playlist on YouTube of this series, uh, which uh, we're now on episode 38. Uh, so there's quite a bit of, of background that we've got. So if, if you're new to us, welcome to the show. Uh, and if you want to go back and look at um, the, uh, the, the, old episodes that we've got where we start we, we cover a huge swath of topics around around the scope of third-party publishing uh everything from uh dealing with artwork dealing with um mechanics of publishing process how do you get your product out there marketing uh kickstarters etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean it's a it's a very broad collection of things uh including we bring in also various other um third-party publishers at times to talk about what are their tick tricks of the trade and so forth and, and, and things that they've learned along the way. So, yeah. Um, so what we're coming to talk about tonight uh, is the concept that the term that you sometimes hear about uh, game balance and how that manifests, how that applies to a publication you might write. And so to start that off, I want to talk about, well, what do exactly do we mean by that? And so on the one hand, if you might, think in terms of if someone uses the term a balanced game that might convey a certain sense but as, as we're talking about game balance i want to talk about in terms think of it in sense of a spectrum you know maybe a, a teeter-totter or whatever uh, a broad swath where on the maybe on the one end you've got what they call what they historically have called the monty hall game which means um a game that is extraordinarily easy the characters get rewards coming out the wazoo all the time. It's very easy to level up. Nobody ever dies or maybe even takes wounds. Um, there's, uh, you know, and I've played in some of these where uh, at, at uh, first or second level, you're encountering artifacts and stuff like that. Um, and I find that this happens a lot of times actually with, um, at least when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, when we were playing a lot of times with new GMs who, who were so stoked about the fantasy element and about about telling a huge fantastical story that they went too big too quick so anyway um so there's 
uh, that one end of the spectrum is the Monty Hall. The other end of the spectrum, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a term for it, but um, where you might, uh, the the other ex and extent would be every game session is a TPK. Um, in fact, maybe every session, um, if it's a character, a game like Paranoia might be a good example of this. You go through multiple characters in any given session of Paranoia. That's, that's very typical. Um, so, and then, and, and so in terms of when we're talking about, about game balance, we want to, we want to stop and think about any given person, any given game, any given system, et cetera, et cetera, is going to land or have a tendency to land somewhere on that spectrum. And so as we're talking about um, the, in, the significance of game balance for your publications, we're going to talk about different facets of that, including um, uh, targeting the specific point on that spectrum where you want to land. And what uh, the uh, Trevor, you got one comment that says, Trevor, nice meeting you at Game Hall Con. Redheaded guy is how he identifies himself. Redheaded guy. <laughs> <laughs> the well, history prof. The redheaded guy. The history prof is his, uh, is his handle on, on ah, Twitch. Ah, I know who that is. Yep. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, so as we'll dig into this, uh, you know, we don't we don't want to give the impression that what we're talking about is always having what you might call a perfectly balanced game per se. Because for one thing, I'm not sure that there is such a thing. Uh, but anyway, at any rate, uh, we we'll want to give uh, stress the point that there's customization around the notion of game balance, and just your your product is going to meet a particular point. And we want to help you try to meet the point that, that you have in mind. So um, if we talk in terms of uh, is what is the ideal point on that spectrum? Well, I think there's no such thing as ideal. Um, but uh, we certainly, as, as Trevor and I talk about our, our gaming styles and our GMing styles and our writing styles, yeah, I suspect we have a tendency to land towards different points. And so I'll throw out first where, where I where I tend to land and then Trevor will describe where he tends to land. And then we'll talk about how that might impact uh, our products. And then we're going to dig into about how you can help it impact your products or how it ought to impact the way you write your products. So um, my personal approach, and some people might say that that uh, I'm, I'm uh, overly softy in this, in this sense and might say, how did you end up in DCC? Then I might get to that. Um, I very, very rarely kill characters as a GM. Uh, usually, I like to reserve that for when the character, when the, when basically when the player has done something stupid that just begs for it. Um, and I have had a few cases where that has happened, but in general, a lot of this comes to I am really big into role playing, and I'm really big into long, drawn out campaigns. And I find it dis very disruptive to um, that process. If you have, oh, this person's character, you get to maybe third or fourth level, this person's character is dead. They got to work in a different character. That creates a lot of difficulties. And um, part of me too, like I said, I'm a little bit of softy. People get so very attached to that. Buku <laughs> and kill all the characters. Oh, well, yes. Um, uh, people, uh, I, I want... Uh, now there's times where maybe the character's death is a great part of the story and you know then then so be it but um uh so some of that comes down to just the way that i, I approach uh dealing with my players dealing with campaigns um and as such i tend to that now it's not to say at least i don't think that i make uh games super easy. I certainly don't tend towards Monty Hall. Uh, maybe when I was a kid, I did. My, I, my idea of the ideal point on that spectrum is to make it challenging, to make it thought provoking, to make it to where you have to stop and think about what you're going to do, as opposed to every round is just, oh, I'm going to swing my sword again. Oh, I'm going to swing my sword again. That gets boring. I want you to be challenged to where you've got to come up with something imaginative. And if you don't, then things are going to be really difficult. And then when you get to that point where you're dealing with the boss monster, you know, my last uh, big campaign that, that we wrapped up, the big boss monster fight 
came down to uh, there was the party, I think, had maybe six players. Five of them were, were unconscious. One player was left facing the boss down to the last round and managed to kill off the boss. And I felt like that was the perfect balance. And that character managed then to, uh, you know, they were high enough level that the other, the ones who, who were unconscious, uh, you know, they were able to rescue them before they bled out. But I felt like, all right, that was to where they were really pushed to their limit, but just barely managed to succeed. And, and that's that to me was was where I feel like the the ideal um, place to land. Um, question: Where do you stand on the idea of verisimilitude and uh, simulation taking importance over balance? That's what I liked about uh, OG D and D. Could stumble into a room of thirty goblins, <laughs> balance be damned. Well, and I per- personally, I kind of feel like it's got to make sense. Is there a reason why there would be thirty goblins in that place? If you have a situation where a party blunders into a fortress because they don't give it any forethought, then all right, you get what you deserve. If you're just walking through uh, the forest and you just happen upon a horde of 50 orcs or whatever, you know, oh, it was a goblin disco. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I want, uh, it's important to me for my, for my adventures to have what they would might call ecology to where it makes sense. There's a reason why this is happening. There's a reason why it's there. You don't have to suspend your disbelief too overly much. Now, that reason might not be readily apparent to the players immediately, but um, I want it to have something that makes sense. I feel like that helps with the immersion. All right, so that's where I tend to land. Um, and then as the game, especially in a campaign situation, as the game situation goes on, I tend to get more and more complex because the, the characters have more and more complicated capabilities and more things that they can tap into. So... Trevor, why don't you tell us uh, about your tendencies? So, um, I guess I would say to, that I am, I am, um, I am a little less focused on balance. I believe in in establishing a situation, whatever mm-hmm. that situation may be. We're going to storm the castle. We're going to do this. We're going to play through this adventure, and then um, um, I don't kill players. I let players kill themselves. Um, <laughs> And so it's a great way to put it. Yeah, I, I am. I, 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 my, I see my job primarily as a first responder to the situation, right? I, now I've generated the situation, whatever that situation is. Um, and sometimes, and I, I tend to have the same framework, no matter whether we're playing a storytelling kind of narrative heavy game or a kind of rob the dungeon heavy game, right? So, so there is this, this access, which by the way, has been, with Dungeons and Dragons and role playing in general, since the first zines, right? Um, since the very first non, you know, TSR publications on role playing games, this this is this is this is an ongoing conversation. If you look at the history, um, I'm I'm the person who responds to what the players tell me they're doing. I believe in ecology 100% based on whatever situation I've developed. So I just play it to its logical conclusion. Um, and I le- and I believe that, that there is something really important in the game that needs to be expressed, and that is context. As a matter of fact, like real estate, where location, location, location is what's important, I believe that in a role-playing game, context, context, context is important. And, uh, and so if you look at any products that I'm developing especially when we get into adventures, which is something that I'm just starting to think about publishing, you're going to see that they're very context heavy. I believe in giving clues to players, you know, telling them what their sensory input is and letting them decide uh, where to go and what to do and how to do it. That's not my job. Um, I'll tell them what roles they need to make. I'll tell them whether they're successful or not. I will tell them what they encounter, but I'm not going to tell them what to do. And that's a great so, way to put it. Yeah. And that's just, that just, that's not my position. And as a player, um, it, the same, I, I expect to not be told what to do. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I expect to be left to hang myself or not be able to think my way through a trap or whatever that happens or, or to figure it out and move on. That's, that's perfectly acceptable too. Um, so, uh, so in terms of balance, I don't believe a game has balance. I, be, I believe a game has situations and you need to work through a situation. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, 
sometimes a situation is too dangerous for you at this moment. And you should walk away if you have the chance. And you should back out and mm -hmm. regroup. And if you really want to go there again, you should think, how many hirelings do I have to hire? How do I get a wizard? How do I get potions? How do I get what I need to properly tackle that event? Mm -hmm. And that is, is a perfectly logical and reasonable way to encounter something. Mm -hmm. To say, you know what? I'm really wounded and I need to leave because I think there's a dragon on the other side of that door and I'm certainly not up to fighting a dragon. So I'm going to go get some help, right? So yeah, and I, I also yeah. believe that when you do back out, you are giving an opportunity to judge to, you know, restock. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah, because the monsters are smart too. Monsters are smart too. Mm -hmm. And so so that's, that's I guess that's my framework. Um, you know, I think we may not be as far away as, as we perhaps thought. Yeah, maybe um, be not. Because, yeah, I, I like to think of it too in terms of it all comes down to agency and yep. as I look at it. I want the players to have agency to where you don't feel, even if it's a very difficult game, you feel like at least it mattered whether you did this or that. Yep. If you feel like it doesn't matter what I do, because I've played in games that are like this, where it doesn't matter what I do, the GM is just there to, there to tell the story they want to tell, then you don't need me to be part of that game. No, no. And oh, that make a movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that gets to where in my mind it falls into what I call over scripting. And we played in one game where the GM was literally he was taking a doing a, a literature uh, or a, a writing class in college. He had written a novel and we were literally going through the plot of his novel. And if we deviated from that plot, he would sledgehammer it to push us into the plot of his novel. Yeah, that's no fun. Yeah. No. So, yeah, from a standpoint of, I like the way you put it, let players kill themselves. Yeah, ex absolutely. If someone is going to do what I, I look at it as, if someone's going to do something foolhardy, where you're going to do something that you should know better, then, yeah, I have no problems with you dying. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to go out of my way to see it as my job is to kill the party. No, my job is to create an, an, a scenario in which an adventure can happen. Right. So what I want to see, and, and, and let me let me bring it back to, I once, uh, I ran um, People of the Pit. People mm -hmm. of the Pit, written by Joseph Goodman. I believe it's the second, uh, maybe it's the first DCC role-playing game adventure. I can't remember, 67, 66, something like that. And, um, and at the same time we were running through People of the Pit, I was running it. I happened to come across a review of People of the Pit online. And 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 the, the final quote uh, for people of the pit uh, has always stuck with me. And when the players complained or or you know were like, oh my god, this is all you know, this is really hard. I would say, yeah, but the reviewer said that people of the pit was tough but fair, mm -hmm. right? That was their final analysis: tough but fair. And that's and, and you know, I I really take that to heart. I want to be I want to be the tough but fair, you know, GM. I'm not I'm not going to railroad you. I'm not going to money haul you. I'm going to respond appropriately, mm -hmm. and uh, and and things are going to be, you know, they're going to be they're going to be surprises. Mm -hmm. But if you use your head and you use your wits, you should be able to get through those. And sometimes knowing to use your wits is knowing to back up. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can take, I'll take just thirty seconds here to 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 pitch a concept, just in case this helps any young or, or, or newish GMs out there. You know, I've been playing since 1980 and I, and I started GMing probably 1981. So I've been running games for a long time. And occasionally I run into a situation, a new person is starting to GM. They've been playing for a little while. They want to start running games and they ask for advice. And I always give the same advice and, and invariably it gets ignored. And that is my single most important suggestion to any GM because it's the single biggest mistake that I see GMs make is don't over script. I know you've got this cool idea of what you want to have happen, but if you take away care players agency, you you've, you've nuked the game. Don't over script. Let it, ha let what happens happens. And, and even if it's something you totally did not expect, those will be the memorable moments that will be great fun. And almost without exception, I give that advice and then I play in their first game and they've overscripted. <laughs> but anyway, if someone's uh, looking uh, is a newish GM out there or looking to GM, I, I can't stress that enough. Um, 
let the game unfold as it unfolds. Um, this is why when I run games now, uh, whether it's at a con or, or especially at a con, but even at, at home game, I learned this from Brendan LaSalle and I love this. I always roll my die in front of the GM screen. So the players can see what I get. So there's no ver so that that for one thing, they join in that experience of waiting to see what comes up. But also they know I'm just letting it happen the way it happens. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's useful. Um, I don't even use a GM screen most of the time. So <laughs> okay. I'm just right there in the yeah. open with people. But yeah, no, I believe that I, I believe you're right. Uh, you know, um, and actually to bring it back, first of all, I think overscripting is a problem. Um, you know, I once ran a, a seven year vampire campaign off of an 11 by 17 sheet of paper with just, you know, blurbs and, you know, names of organizations and why they hated each other and who, who was in them. That was it. That was mm -hmm. the game notes. That was the prep. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, it went for seven years and, and we, we had a great time and it's, uh, you know, often talked about among my friends, uh, you know, we, you know, when we, when we get together and everything, but to bring that back to, to, to game, the question of game balance and production in terms mm -hmm. of third party publications and everything, um, you know, I have long uh, thought that, that actually writing adventures is not the thing that I really wanted to do. Now I'm writing some, but, um, but really what I wanted to do, and I, and I've got a couple coming out next year is write what I call set pieces, right? Here is a great set piece. You do with it what you will, but it it's it, this is this is a layer for an evil person, right? And, right? and it's very specific and it's tailored and it's really customized and it's really detailed and it has all the notes you need to run it and and, it, and it's got some great ideas in it and everything. But then you can come in and you know a, a judge can pick that up and they can run with it and and make it the layer for their bad guy. Yeah. Instead of me telling you that oh here's a bad guy and here's his layer. And this is the story. Mm -hmm. I just want to give you the layer, right? Uh, and so, so I have an entire. I haven't released them yet, but um, I've had the first one done for over a year, um, and we'll we'll release it in the spring. I'm pretty sure is uh, is a is a line of products that I'm calling sandbox set pieces. They are designed to be played in a in a campaign when you need something special, when you need uh -huh. a, an incredibly detailed setting for of a specific type. Nice. Um, and and then and then that the could have repeat of repeat playability, right? Mm -hmm. so a location you might come back to multiple times. Okay. Um, and so so yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, uh, that throws the idea of balance out the window. It just says this is the logical thing that a certain type of bad guy would build, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is this is how it is. I don't care how deadly it is, um, but you know, it, it needs to be, and 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 that's where that idea of context comes in, right? Mm -hmm. By providing clues, by providing sensory information to give a moment for a player to have pause and go, you know what, maybe, maybe there's more here than we think. Um, those are really important things. And I let that just work itself out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, All right. So as we talk about <clears throat> other implications for your, your publication, one of the things that I would say is the first thing that, that you consider is, you're going to want to whatever, wherever you place <clears throat> your adventure or, or setting or whatever it happens to be, the piece that you're publishing, wherever that happens to land on the balance spectrum, <clears throat> you, I think it's important that you convey that that is a readily apparent to the potential buyer. Um, <clears throat> because if I'm different game groups and different GMs are going to lean towards different, different expectations and you don't want them to, you want them to get the product that they think they're getting. Let me give a quick example of that. <clears throat> um, anyone who plays Call of Cthulhu knows that this is a game that you ought to expect to have a high rate of death slash insanity. It's just part of the setting. And you don't go into, you shouldn't go into that game with the expectation that you're going to have a character who is going to go through a, a long campaign and, and come out just fine. Um, it's just not the nature of it. And so there's a certain default expectation. If you're putting out, say, uh, an adventure or a supplement for that kind of a game, likewise with uh, the old Ravenloft, etc. There's a certain expectation with certain settings that 
people are assuming if I'm getting a product for this game, it's going to have a certain level of difficulty that's associated with it. Now, if you don't have that context that provides you with an, uh, an automatic assumed um, sense of where, where your product's going to lie, you want to deliver that information somehow. And here's one of the ways that I would say go about doing that. One is, um, you know, for first, on, on a lot of products, say you've got an adventure, typically on the back cover, you've got a... Um, You've got a quick blurb that gives a little bit about the feel, the basic notion, oh, legend tells of the such and such dragon and the such and such whatever. And that typically is something that uh, is minimal on spoilers because in case the player picks it up, maybe on the inside in the introduction, you've got a quick thing that gives you a little bit more sense of to where you would convey to a potential GM who's picking this up, what is the nature of the challenge that the players are going to have to face? Um, is it a, is it a horde of thousands of, of, uh, a, a fortress that's populated by a thousand orcs? Is it, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this ancient dungeon that's got, uh, that's nothing but traps. Um, you know, is it something like the old tomb of horrors to where, um, it's got magical things going on that, uh, again, your, your odds of getting an intact party through that are pretty slim. So you want to convey in your, in your description, some sense of what is the type of challenges they're going to face. And then also, if it's something that is a very deadly thing, like, again, Tomb of Horrors, for example, I think it's good to convey that in the write-up. Now, not just saying right off in the words of, this is probably a TPK, but come up with some way to, to, to emphasize that this is a, a very challenging situation. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, right? I mean, so you can use some of the role-playing game tropes to quickly move that, or, you know, get that message across. Expect a hack and slash, right? Expect, uh, you know, expect a thinking man's game. Well, what, mm -hmm. what is a thinking man's game, right? Tomb of Horrors was called a thinking man's game. Actually, it was just called a luck if I survive game. But, right, um, right. you know, but the thinking man's game is something where there's going to be puzzles, there's going to be traps, there's going to be things mm -hmm. that you have to think about. I tell you and what, so, if you use the spell augury, yeah. In that module, boy, that's a that's a game changer. It's a game changer. Yeah. So so you know you need to think about how can I present the information that is necessary to get things across. Because if you've got a hack and style a hack and slash type of group, they probably don't want a thinking man's game type of module, mm -hmm. right? They're probably not concerned about whether or not they lose sanity. But you may have a group that really is into that. Even in Dungeon Crawl Classics, there's a horror game line, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have that, you know, you may have a group that doesn't want body horror, but if you're running a, a you know, it consumes, you're probably going to come across some of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you need to be able to clearly denote what's going on. And at the same time, though, not give everything away, mm -hmm. right? It's one of the things um, that can be really nuanced on a cover and cover art is um is you know giving away the big bad giving away a critical uh you know a critical encounter um or something like that right it's it's a very hard to actually come up with a great cover mm -hmm. that is compelling but so vague that you can't you know that you can hold it up to the players and they don't know what's going on mm -hmm. and so so that's actually something that uh, you know i've put a lot of thought into uh in terms of covers for uh, things yeah exactly yeah and i do make a point if i'm uh i if especially if i've got a module i've got a, a couple of adventures that are very role play heavy not a lot of combat and I, and I know that i don't want someone to be disappointed buying it and find out that you know if that if that's not what they're into that that's that that they're getting something that they weren't expecting so in that case i do it may in, in, in almost so many words I will say this is a, a role play heavy adventure um, uh, on you, either my back notes or on my introduction page so that someone who's thinking about it will know that, hey, if that's an, if this and I'll do the same thing if I'm putting a description on a convention event, if this is a, a whole, could be, because, um, you know, maybe with a lot of convention events, you don't get that. So if it is role, very role play heavy, I'll make that clear in my description. Uh, we've got a question, thinking outside the box and using uncommonly used more niche skills and items in interesting ways to help detect 
to circumnavigate traps and combat to gain advantages in combat or what I would associate with thinking man's module. Yeah, yeah. Less so puzzles. Not a fan of puzzles. Combat and traps can be puzzles in themselves. Sure. Yeah, I like having tactical situations to where if it gives the players the opportunity to use intelligent tactics in a combat and may have that make all the difference. Yeah, I agree. And as a matter of fact, while you're talking about those things, you know, I just drew, I, we, we always have show notes and everything. So I just drew this uh-huh. little show note thing and it just says, look, you could put on a one to five scale there, right? Combat, role play, role play, R-O-L-E play versus yes. R-O-L-L play. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, you could have uh, puzzles, traps, and you could have tactics. Nice. Right? And you could, you could just rate those. You know, this is a tactics heavy uh, scenario. This is a role playing heavy scenario, right? This is a combat heavy scenario. Dude, that is a fabulous idea. I'm going to start using that on my products. You I can love have that. It. Absolutely, right? I love because that. It, it succinctly, generically, and in no way gives away, you know, what's going on. And and but but man, it, it communicates almost mm-hmm. directly what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and 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 you know, and if if the idea of game balance is really from a third party publisher's perspective, communicating effectively to the uh, the potential buyers um you know something like that a little rating system that you develop uh maybe maybe you put on there something like you know body body you know body horror or something like that right mm-hmm. you could have many different categories um and then just consistently using it is really mm-hmm. helpful. So, yeah and i think especially if uh, you since you mentioned the uh the dcc's horror line i think especially if, if you're writing an adventure for that <clears throat> I think it would be a good idea to have some indication that's readily accessible to the potential purchaser. How graphic is the horror in your adventure? So they know what they're getting into. Um, yeah. Because quite frankly, some, some groups and some people just simply aren't, aren't, aren't prepared for that dealing with something that's, that's highly graphic horror, like you said, body horror, for example. And so I think that's, that's good to convey. Well, and I would go as far as to say, um, I once had a situation when I was in high school and I was running, I was running a game and, um, and I ran across a guy who had a phobia of insects and I had no idea uh, that, that, that this guy had this phobia. He, we were, we were in a cave system, the light had gone out and they could feel the insects crawling on them. And I was describing that in detail. Right. And, and the guy, and we were in a dark room and I hadn't even realized we were in a dark room. (laughs) It's uh-huh. like we had one little like 40 watt light light bulb and that was it. Right. Uh-huh. And, and so, and the guy finally had to say, say, I need you to stop because this is really, it's just wigging me out. I can't handle this. Uh-huh. And so we had to, I had to tone that down. Right. And so, uh, so yeah. So the other thing to know is uh, as a judge, know your players um, and, and, and know yeah. whether they can handle that kind of stuff. So, so this uh, two prong system there. Right. Um, but yeah, certainly you could put that under, some kind of horror component um, or graphic detail component or something like that. Exactly. Um, to me, insects don't bother me. Mm-hmm. That's why I work with insects, you know, professionally. Um, but, but to this guy, that was, you know, that was the end. He was like, no, I'm done. And, <laughs> and we need to, we need to turn the lights on and I need to, I need to go out and get some fresh air. So we finished the game and everything worked out and I didn't describe any more insects. So, all right. Yeah. So, uh, from again the standpoint of of balance, another f- uh, thing that you want to consider in the publication itself are the opponent creatures that uh, your player that your characters will face, and these fall into generally speaking two broad categories: monsters and NPCs. You might argue that there's really not a difference between the two, and in some sense, you might be right. If nothing else, uh, Trevor and I are both firm believers that uh, your monsters should be played to the, or their appropriate intelligent level. That uh, if, you've got a, if you've got a creature, say a vampire or whatever, that has intelligence, they should play, be played that they are doing everything they can to not be destroyed. But anyway, um, opponent creatures. So um, I've been asked about this, so I'll, I'll go I'll spend just a real quick moment, moment going into it. I've been specifically asked before, uh, in fact, this is one of the questions that spawned this episode. Well, somebody asked me, hey, could you at some point go into how do I stat a monster so that it's an appropriate challenge level for a party? If I'm making a new monster, and let's face it, DCC is very big about the notion of custom monsters. 
I love that about it. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> I know some people, you know, I'll just for example, my wife's been in GM for a long, long time. She's great at, at, uh, at managing um, uh, uh, context and a story. She still doesn't like statting things up. So I'll give you the approach that I take. And uh, he's talking about this. Is I've been wondering about this for ages. Okay, good. So um, here's the approach that I take. Uh, and and then I ha you have to bear this out with testing. Okay. Uh, in some of the later versions of, uh, or I don't know, at least in, in, in 3.5 edition of D&D, of &D, they had this thing called challenge rating. I think Pathfinder also had it. Generally speaking, very roughly, a thing's challenge rating was often very close to its hit points. I'm sorry, hit dice. And that was generally speaking close, tended to be close to the uh, the the hit die level of a party that would face it and 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 be 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 well poised in terms of the of this challenge rating. Um, what I tend to do is, um, I start off with. Okay, keep in mind that you've got a party that has typically, say, four or five characters. And I'm going to face typically a, a set of creatures that is smaller, to usually smaller than the party and has roughly the same hit dice as the party or slightly less. Um, one thing I'm keeping in mind, especially if there's an adventure, you know, the, some of it too depends on, is, is this the only combat that they're going to face in, say, a day or whatever? Or if they're going into a dungeon and they're going to face set of creatures after set of creatures after set of creatures, you got to keep that in mind. Um, it'll be the, it'll become unfeasible to do a dungeon crawl if every room just about kills the party and you have to extract yourself from the module. Unless you want that to, unless that's your intent, and you want it to be this thing that takes an incredible amount of time because you have to retreat and heal up after every single room. So anyway. Um, and so then I do some start doing some math in my head. Okay, uh, the creature, um, I, I assume if I want the creature to hit roughly 50% of the time. Okay, then what what kind of uh, attack bonus would it need to have uh, against a, a, a typical AC in the party? Okay, if it does X amount of damage, how many rounds would it take to take down an average party member? Likewise, the creature has, say, a 15 AC. That means the party is going to hit it 30% of the time, okay? They're, the party's damage is on average this much. That means on average, it's going to take them how many rounds to take this thing down? And I kind of play that out and figure out, okay, generally speaking then, yeah, there's always lucky shots and, you know, DCC, it's the nature of it. You got to roll with it. But in average then, as that math plays out, I expect most monsters to take three to five rounds or so unless it's a uh, you know a boss monster or something that's very smart and has a lot of challenge to it or a room that's very exotic or whatever um now another factor in this is maybe it's not a single monster but you know a group of kobolds or whatever you know then i'm keeping in mind that okay each player or i'm sorry each character is going to be maybe tied up with one one to one or whatever ha the ratio happens to be and so that I have to, I'm, I'm just figuring out averages in my head of uh, if I take the mean, if I take the average um, likelihood of the single damage, that means on average it's doing this much damage per round, and then just play out how many rounds, and as those two, as those two effects play out, the player's damaging, I'm sorry, the character's damaging the creature, the creature damaging the players, which of those comes out on top? Um, and I, I, I'm wanting most adventure, most, most combats to be that the characters will eventually come out on top after a, after a bit of a, of a, you know, after a bit of a fight. Now I might design a room or an environment. I'm using the room for term room very generically such that if they play it smart, there's a couple things in the environment they can use that makes that fight a whole lot easier. On the other hand, if they play it dumb, it might be a whole lot more difficult uh, and, and give some buff to the creature. So that's the general approach I take. And if I've got a lot of uncertainty to it, I'll ask at least one person to play test with me. And maybe it's just a quick 
run through. They run five characters. They run two of the characters. I run two of the characters, and I run the monster, and we just see how the math plays out. So, Trevor, what's your thoughts on that? I think this is where you and I diverge. Okay. So, first of all, I have to tell you, as as a diehard third edition player, and and I enjoyed three five as well. Um, the CR system I thought was one of the big advantages of the um, of third edition era play, and obviously Goodman has uh, abandoned it. And and I and I and I understand it, but I, I get your point about CR, and I think about CRs quite a bit. Um, when I was running third edition, um, I actually completely rehacked the XP system. Mm -hmm. um rating players on counters not based on the monsters but based on them um and so i would rate them on either i would rate them on creativity mm -hmm. on role playing role playing as in r o l e playing mm -hmm. playing their character um contribution to the game uh, to the moment whatever that scene was mm -hmm. um attention and this was a player thing is the player paying attention at the table are they helping keep everybody's focus are they keeping us in the moment or are they on their phone texting somebody? Don't get um, me started on that. Yeah. And so this is why I built it right into the XP system because I could just very quietly, and I had little cards mm -hmm. um, and then most valuable player would get a bonus. And so you could basically break down uh, by, by player level, right? Your average play level. And you could, and I had a, I, I had reverse hacked that because Monty Cook actually in third edition told you it should take 13 and a half encounters to go from a level to next. Here's the XP progression. And you could reverse hack that and find that line. Mm -hmm. uh, and then rated these on a one to four level and finding that if you got a two on everything, you fit that curve perfectly. Mm -hmm. right? So, so that's, I've never published that, but that was something that we used extensively and players to this day, when we, when, when they, when we pull those characters, they have stacks of little cards they were about half the size of a business card with the little formula on it. And I would just go ding, 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 ding. It was the rust monster. Da, 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 da. Here's your total. This is your XPs. Here's you, here's you, here's you. Uh -huh. Everybody got XPs based on how they contributed to the play, not on the difficulty of the monster. And so, nice. um, so it was a, it was a completely different system. I believe um, that in dungeon crawl classics, uh, um, and I've done a fair bit of monster conversion and creation, that the most important thing you need to think of as a player, as a judge, and when you're statting out things, is the dice chain. Okay, and um, and 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 this is actually really important to me, um, and it's one of the reasons why I actually diverge from published Goodman Games modules, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I think you should think about the dice chain. I think you should think about laws of probability, um, and so I'm always trained as a probability person when I thought about science. And so, you know, what are the odds if I roll a D5 that I'm going to get a five, that I'm going to get a one, that I'm going to get two. Well, they're one in five, no matter what. Uh -huh. But if you, but law of numbers and, and central limit theorem tell us we're going to, we're going to hone towards a midline, right? Uh -huh. We're going to most often see a middle value. Um, and so, so I think of the averages of those and say, on average, I'm going to roll, you know, a three or a two and a half on a D5. And, what can my players take, right? Is it, and, and then I say, okay, so if, if I've got a whole bunch of second level players, the average hit point across those is going to be on average three to 10 hit points, right? Mm -hmm. uh, wizards are really low. Halflings, thieves, clerics, kind of in the middle. Clerics are on the high end. Warriors are at the, at the, at the extreme high end, right? So I look at the group and I say, what, am I, what have I got? And, um, and if I'm making things up on the fly, or um, I am statting out things for an adventure, I'm thinking about, if you want to think about how long something takes, I'm like, okay, how many D5s do I need to do in damage or D7s or D10s, or whatever the average needs to be. And I'm thinking about laws of averages and average outcomes from dice rolls. Um, and that's how I approach it. Um, and for everything, for hit points, for AC, for everything. How often are my players going to hit AC 12? How often are they going to hit AC 15? Mm -hmm. How often are they going to hit AC 20? Right. I can tell you that when, uh, you know, I did a little bit of converting for Goodman games uh, in dangerous denizens and everything. And they asked us to have um, high, high AC, low hit points. Right. So it's hard to break through, but once you break through, it's, it, it's a little easier to damage it and, and gain a victory on it. Mm 
Uh-huh. Uh, I didn't always agree with that, uh, but it's a it's a good rule of thumb if you're making something up from scratch. But to me, this is where ecology becomes critical. I think about what is this a creature supposed to do? Why is it here? Uh-huh. What is it doing? And if it's if it's a saber toothed tiger, then it's going to be a saber toothed tiger. And if it's an armadillo, then it's an armadillo, right? And those two things are very different. And I gauge them in power based on what this thing should be doing ecologically. Uh-huh. And that's how I think of it. Of, and I think about that for traps too, right? If the intent of the person who created the trap is to kill you, the trap should try to kill you. If the intent is to scare you off, the trap should scare you off, right? If the intent uh-huh. is to teleport you across the room, it should do that, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I always think that the most important thing to do is be true to whatever you're selling. And as a judge, you're selling a room or you're selling a dungeon or you're selling a story. Uh-huh. And I want those things. Now, sometimes I throw, I, I, th- I throw, you know, an absolute, you know, red herring at them. Right. And I make them think it's a saber tooth tiger, but it's really an armadillo. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm not above doing that, but I do, when I create creatures, I take it to the pure logical conclusion of this creature should be able to do X and I need to make it so it can do X because it's a, it's a saber tooth tiger or it's a polar bear, right? It can walk for days and I'm going to put endurance down as a special ability and say, this thing will walk you to the end of the earth and it will not tire. Mm-hmm. Right. And it will. And, and, and then it becomes a, you fight the polar bear, you didn't kill it. And it just harasses <laughs> you until you die. Yeah. Um, and, and it knows, okay, that was a little buff, but if I wait two days, he's going to be a lot less buff. And so, so I think about those things. I think about the ecology of the situation, the ecology of the creature, the ecology of the intent of the creator of something. Because let's face it, most traps are created, right? Now, sometimes you can have natural disaster type situations. like That function is, like a trap. Yeah, that sure. functions like a trap. The, the, the floor is caving in because <clears throat> the space below it doesn't have the supports because they've rotted it out because right. it's exposed to water and stuff like that. And I also think about that stuff too. Uh-huh. So those are the things that I think of. I try to write uh, and develop things that are true to what they are. Uh-huh. So we have a question, uh, assuming there's a party of 16 zero level characters and monsters, as you described, um, how many of those would be reasonable to pit against the party? Okay, one thing that doesn't need to make special reference, and I hadn't thought about this, was what about the funnel? Very different situation. I think it is quite reasonable for every encounter in a funnel to kill at least one character. Um, Because part of the point of the funnel, as the name implies, is to trim down the party. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, In that case, you know, if you've got 16, how many in in any given encounter? I think it depends on how many encounters you've got. Uh, But in that case, maybe maybe they're facing, you know, typically say one to four or so. Um, with the expectation that every given round that one of those creatures may stand a 50% chance of hitting. And if they hit, they're almost certainly going to kill the, the character that they hit. Um, so in that case, yeah, with a funnel, you'd have to take it a bit of a different approach. Absolutely. Um, the expectation, now again, exactly how many you throw at the party at once depends on how many uh, encounters the party is going to face, but certainly you you want to in that case have the expectation that you should be whittling down the party as it goes through, and that can be through absolute randomness, right? Uh, look mm-hmm. at um, um, sailors in the starless sea, and as you're going into the castle, you can go in a back way, and that rubble, those big blocks of stone, are all uneven, are all all kind of uh, they're jumbled, but they're but they they move around, right? Mm-hmm. If somebody if somebody slips and falls, they all make a reflex save. They're going to cause a big stone to move around. And I can't tell you how many characters died. I think I, I think we killed five characters at once uh-huh. because somebody slipped, a big stone suddenly flipped around and it just smashed people into the ground and ground them to dust. Exactly. Uh, you know, and so, and it was just like, everybody make a reflex save, you know, five people didn't make it. They're all dead. <laughs> yeah. And so, so that's the, you know, the, um, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for a very specific word the absolute kind of farcical nature of randomness in a funnel 
is what gives you the character that you didn't expect. Right. So, so yeah, um, I try and, uh, well, I was play testing a funnel at, at game hole con. And one of the things I was paying attention to at the funnel, you know, at the table was how many people are dying, how fast are they dying? And am I losing like 12 people at a time or am I only losing one or two or three, you know, and, and what's my pacing like, you know, so, mm-hmm. you know, especially for something like con play, I'm often adjusting a game on the fly, whether I'm play testing it or not, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there, there's different intent here too. Right. So on a con, I'm trying to, we've only got four hours, three and a half, if you really think about it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm adjusting things on the fly to create tension, to pull things around. That's right. a judging style. Mm-hmm. But the thing is written should be able to allow for that. Right. Uh, oh, which gets me to the final point that I was going to say. I uh, specifically differ from Goodman Games on one of the stat block items, and that's hit points. One thing I refuse to put in any of my pre statted adventures or sandbox locations is an actual hit point count for any creature you and i'll give you hit dice Mm -hmm. and then i believe it should be left up to fate what the judge rolls at that moment and if Mm -hmm. you have three of them i'll put a little note in the margin now that says creature one creature two creature three so you can write hit points down and actually track them in the margin of your adventure Mm -hmm. um but i am not interested in forcing someone into you know it's a three hit die it's a three d8 creature which should give you, you know, anywhere between three and 24 hit points, but all of them have 11 or 12 hit points. I say, let the chips fall where they may. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, sometimes you get things that have been, at, that have been, that have been wounded before you show up or they're just weak, right. Mm-hmm. Or they're uber buff. And, mm-hmm. and that's just, to me, that's part of the, um, versim- you know, versimilitude of the moment of a Dungeon mm-hmm. Call Classics game. And so, so I, I don't, I don't try and force anything like that down the throat of a judge. So one of the other pieces of, of the, the challenge profile is uh, NPCs. And by that, I would say this is any creature that you face that is particularly intelligent. And, uh, you know, so oftentimes that's a human or humanoid thing, but it might not necessarily be. Um, oftentimes it's something that you interact with beyond simply combat. Uh, maybe even if it's the villain doing the monologue and the, you know, when they, right before they go in to fight you or whatever. And I think, uh, I think Trevor and I agree on this. Well, let me, let me mention one thing about, about uh, mechanics on that. Um, build the NPC as I build NPCs as characters, just as I would build a character. Um, and that means making, uh, making choices in terms of spell selection, in terms of equipment they would have, et cetera, et cetera keeping in mind that the NPC has had, you know, time to reach this level. And in that time, they've made choices towards their survival. And uh, uh, Trevor and I are both of the mind that you should play an intelligent monster as intelligent. And it has thought about the, the these characters it's running into are not the first ones it's encountered. It has thought about, you know, if it's a vampire in a castle, it knows there's the the plucky uh, townsfolk every once in a while that's going to try to come and, and fight him. He has thought about how to defend himself, and he has not gotten a thousand years old by being uh, foolhardy. So have them use their intelligence. Have them use their... If you put yourself in your position, if you were a character, if you had a character that was in that position, what would they do? How would they plan? There is there's a background that leads up to that point. What, how have they how have they lived up to that background po- or through the background up to that point? Yeah, and, and I would add to that by saying uh, an intelligent or any adversary should mm-hmm. use its resources, and I mean all of its resources. Not, mm-hmm. I'm not talking about hit points and special abilities. If you come into a into into a town and you insult the wealthy landowner uh, while you're in the bar. Right, the wealthy landowner might very well just send some of his people that work on his on, on his lands to come beat you up, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and and so so that's something that you need to think about is is that actions have consequences, and and my job as a judge is to think about what are the consequences of those actions um, through the lens of whatever that adversary is. You know, a giant is very different than 
um, you know, than a beholder is very different than an abolith, which is very different mm-hmm. than a land baron. And, and they so, have their different goals, and you should play those goals appropriately. Yeah. And so, as a matter of fact, I got a, a good shout out to to Nick Baron and some of his uh, standard work. Right, giving his NPCs rumors, giving them secret knowledge, giving them goals, and writing them down for judges to then pick up as little pieces they can take out without yeah. having to develop themselves. That is a class act in uh, and, and a good master course lecture on on how to build NPCs and mm-hmm. adversaries. Right, they don't all have to be high level. But I would point out that um, there's there's some different schools of thought here. If you follow, you know, the the conversation that Joseph Goodman is having in the DCC RPG rulebook, right? If you go to the judges section and think about what he's saying. He's saying that adventurers are different and everybody else is like a plucky, you know, uh, you know, zero level or first level. And, mm-hmm. and this is the same type of XP progression that Gary Gygax put in the DMG first edition, mm-hmm. right? Um, that, that 99% of people never get above zero level. Right. Um, and the problem with that is it is that what it means is that your characters effectively become superheroes. And so, you know, and and those are fun games to play. Don't get me wrong, but it, I think it I think it really tones down a whole series of adversaries um, that should have levels and should have influence and should have you be able to do things. Mm-hmm. And so uh, now that is mitigated by Dungeon Crawl Classics low, uh, you know, DC system. Right. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, something a child can do is DC five and something an every man can do is DC 10 and something, you know. The, the, the really well-trained blacksmith could do is DC 15 and the hero is DC 20. Keeping that in mind is really important. So if you're going to scale, if you're going to change that scale, you need to change that scale too. And so you need to be aware of consequences of changing your, you know, deviating from what, what Dungeon Crawl Classics is really talking about. It's not a problem. You just need to let people know you're doing it. Mm-hmm. So. All right, so another uh, piece of the challenge uh, presentation is traps. We've, we've touched upon this a little bit, but uh, dig in this a little bit more specifically. So um, I think what Trevor said earlier is, is critically important. You have to ask, as, as you are designing a thing, you have to have the question, why is the trap there? What is its purpose? And see to it that it that is targeted around that purpose. Again, it's a trap that's supposed to kill you. The, you know, you know, Egyptian tomb wants to keep tomb robbers out. Well, then the trap is intended to kill the potential tomb robber so they can't get in there and and rob the tomb. If that's the case, it should be lethal. Now, understanding that the person who built the tomb and put that trap in there is recognizing that or is thinking in terms of what would kill an average person or an average, you know, plunderer and, and recognizing that a third level character is not an average person. And so you keep that in mind, something that does say 2d6, 2d8 points of damage. Uh, your average tr- a person who's just kind of uh, uh, bumping around and, and, and trying to get into it, that might be lethal. Um, so it, again, it'll depend on the nature of how, what the resources are at hand of whoever created it, but what, again, so yeah, what was the purpose of the trap? See to it that it, that it accomplishes, that it's capable at least of accomplishing that purpose. Um, and then give some thought to also, um, especially if a party does not have a thief, is this trap a complete showstopper that the adventure is at an end or are there ways in which they can think their way around it? Um, so, and maybe, maybe both of those are reasonable and appropriate. Just understand, uh, that you want to have that consideration. Uh, so Trevor traps. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I have to say that I think we're about to see a complete game changer in traps and trap discussions. Once the DCC converted, um, Grimtooth. uh, Grimtooth's traps comes out. I'm assuming we'll see that sometime next year or in the next 18 months. And mm-hmm. I think what Dungeon Crawl Classics has not had, which is what like third edition had, is a very tight language about a surrounding trap presentation. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, it's kind of nice to have a just a paragraph that describes what it is 
um, when I've been building traps for publication, I find that I often have to give an overall overview of what this trap should do and then give a bullet list of, of the types of things that it actually does so that it's easy to follow because a, a trap is a tense moment for everybody. Uh, for a player, maybe a tense moment, they don't even know they're in it yet. For a judge, it's a tense moment because you wanna make sure that you execute the trap correctly. Um, if you screw the trap up, you could inadvertently kill somebody um, or let them through when you, that was not, that's not how it should have played out. And so, you know, being able to succinctly get across what the trap should do is, is really critical. Um, and, and being clear on what it is intent is, is also really critical, I think. Mm -hmm. And then again, thinking about why is this trap here? And, uh, you know, take, take, take a tune, like, like you were talking about, uh, you know, an Egyptian tomb. I, I actually think that if you went and looked at Egyptian tombs, you would find that they're very small, right? They have lots of passageways that are only like three or four foot wide and maybe five foot tall. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of what's actually going on is going on in those passageways. So thinking about the context of the situation that you're in and passage of time and how that may have adulterated or changed the trap, or maybe it's rotted, dry rotted, because mm -hmm. it's not as, as potent as it would have been 5,000 years ago, so on and so forth. I think those things are all really good th ways to think about traps and provide context. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I I get I see two players, uh, two people who two types of people that talk about the Tomb of Horrors, which is designed to kill players. Right? Mm -hmm. Let's just be clear. That was Gary's. It, you know, his he designed the dungeon to teach a group of players a lesson because he thought they were getting away with too much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, there are two groups of player people uh, people who who think about Tomb of Horrors. The first group is I love it. It's wonderful, in its randomness and just absolute apathy uh to letting you know what's really going on and you know there are tricks and everything in it and there are puzzles and, and you you know it's really hard to suss out and it's sometimes just super random um, on the other hand there are people who are like it's the worst dungeon ever created and what they always cite is not that it's trapped but that it's trapped in a kind of way that is not context driven so mm -hmm. if, you, if you if you can't get any context about what's going on it's impossible to solve the problem in a thinking man type style mm -hmm. right? or a thinking person type style and so the mere kind of randomness of the tomb of horrors often stymies those players and so i kind of tend to side with them and i think that uh and and daniel j bishop has written a couple articles about this that context is really important um and and everything and and giving some prelude if the players are good enough to pick up on it is is really handy and so yeah this is where i think traps can be they can be devastatingly bad for players they should be they're traps, right right but that said players it's good if you can give them some hints so they understand what they're up against and if they die when they had already figured out that it was a poison dart trap, but they still got hit by the dart, at least they look at you and say, well, that was tough, but it was fair. Right? Uh -huh. Again, or, or should have seen that coming. <laughs> I, should, I should have known that, you know, that was, that, that was, that was the thing. The one problem that I see with traps is it's, they're often tied to some mechanics of skills. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, if you didn't figure it out, you didn't get a good skill roll. Um, and this is the same problem with looking for clues which is why I always give sensory conditions for, mm -hmm. for things, you know, uh, a little bit of, a little bit of uh, dry rot. And then, so there's a little pile of, of, of old kind of like rope stuff on the floor or whatever it is. Right. I think about the conditions of the, of the location they're in and then how would that affect those traps? Mm -hmm. I try and provide that sensory data to, to people. And by the way, um, so I, I, I've been developing something called what I call a sensory cue system um and it shortens box text but it allows me to hand random bits of information to players that may mm -hmm. be a red herring but they may be really critically important and i do that on a luck roll because okay. ecc has a luck mechanic and you so did. actually as i've been working through adventures this was one of the other things i was play testing at game con was a series of cards seven eight cards on a given area or a given situation um and i would give a very brief of the briefest of discussion of, of, of general blurbs that I could. 
And then I would let people make a luck check. If they rolled a natural one, they got to pull two cards or two pieces of information. If they made their luck check, they got to pull something. And if they didn't, they didn't. And it simulates the idea that two of us sitting in a room looking at otherwise the same thing, but from two different perspectives, either that's background perspective or life history perspective, or I just can't see through the glass window like the person sitting next to me can. So therefore, I don't see the thing hiding behind the telephone pole. Um, you know, it gives them little bits of information. And what I found that was really helpful with that is it draws players into the game because it gives them a little bit of thing they can narrate or choose not to. Uh, uh -huh. And so it, it, it increases player agency. It increases player engagement. Um, and, and actually, um, from a teaching point of view, uh, it, 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 it mimics the, the, uh, what we call the, the best way to teach someone to do something, which is to, to speak at them and tell them what it is and then show them with a, with a piece of information, right. And then let them ruminate on it. And so you give them a couple seconds, let everybody then say, okay, does anybody say anything? No. And that's okay. Cause you have no idea what piece of information they got, whether it was going to be helpful or not. And, um, and so players have all really responded well to that. So think about how you can bring context and sensation. Um, there's a hierarchy to sensation. I think that's important to realize. You smell things before you usually see or hear them. Um, although sometimes you hear them first because you can't see or smell based on, uh -huh. you know, what. And, and a good trap would be something that obfuscates a sense, right? It uh -huh. makes it so that you can't smell something, but the smell is what you need at the next thing. You can't see something. And so you're relying on your hearing and your smelling and your touch and your taste. And so the hierarchy kind of runs of eyesight um, and then smell and then hearing, and then it moves to taste and touch, right? It, or kind of at the bottom of that. But those are the, those are the, the level in which I try and present information to you smell the fetid swamp before you see it. Right. And, uh -huh. and things like that. So think about presentation when you're dealing with traps or adversaries or anything else. And I think that's really helpful. Yeah. All right, so another piece of the challenge puzzle or the uh, the challenge picture is puzzles. Um, this would be any kind of thing where maybe it's a riddle, for example, or maybe it's a you come to uh, this this wall and there's these peg holes on the wall and you've you know maybe they've got to arrange things a certain way or whatever. Uh, and and the puzzles are are a different kind of creature in the sense that, for the most part, a puzzle, solving a puzzle does not have, is not related to the skill of the characters related to the intelligence of the player. 100%. Yeah. And I think this becomes important from the standpoint that you do occasionally have to recognize that um, there are cases where the character is more intelligent than the person playing them. And so, you know, there may be a point where it's the fair thing to do if the person is playing a wizard who has an 18 intelligence to provide some kind, you know, maybe it's by way of an intelligence check or whatever, to provide, provide some kind of hints and clues um, that can account for this issue. Now, so in terms of, of you're, you're putting a puzzle into a, a published product, um, it's important to, here's where one play testing is available and is very important because I've put puzzles in that I thought, Oh, this should be fairly easy to solve. And what I thought was pretty obvious was absolutely not to the players who played in it. Yep. And so I had to reconsider the way the puzzle was presented. So um, that I think is one of the biggest things about puzzles is just understand that what you think is easy or difficult those things may not, uh, the, the, the players who play it may not uh, think of the same ideas you do. And so um, play testing is going to be critical to get a sense of how difficult the puzzle is and give some thought to. If they fail to solve the puzzle, does it just make the adventure more difficult or is it an absolute showstopper and you cannot continue? If it's an absolute showstopper and you cannot continue the adventure, then be aware of that and you either have to 
work in a possibility of there's a way around that or if that's if that's just how it is and then you just have to they just have to drop the adventure from there okay that's fine just just understand that to be the case yeah i i I think that it's really important to understand that puzzles challenge players not characters the way you can flip that is to think about who made the puzzle is it a wizard in which case it's probably a wizardly type puzzle is it a blacksmith is it a gong farmer right uh and and thereby recognize that certain character occupations um i think have uh you know are going to need some help right they they should help players mm-hmm. you should be able to tell somebody hey your character's a gong farmer and they would know x mm-hmm. right and so one of the things to think about is as you're writing something is providing that context and say you know here's the puzzle okay and i understand that this is a moment that a player is being challenged and it's really a player challenge but they can get a little bit of help a clue if they're you know a weaver or if they're you know this or if they are a gong farmer and so i think that's really helpful too is just like sensory cues is providing a, a list of things that people might just know because they know it um and, and it's important to, to provide that because the judge won't always understand the they they, they understand the, the puzzle at play but they don't understand maybe the context of why the puzzle is there or who built it. And unless mm-hmm. you're very clear about it, and this is, a, you know, I mean, let's face it, writing balanced games, uh, scenarios is all about communication. And, and so you need to think about uh, how you communicate things in your ad- adventure design. This is part of design. You know, adventure writing is not, it's not good enough to have a great adventure. It's it's the next side of that is the presentation of that adventure. I let me give you an example, and it's a really good one. Um, uh, you know, I was sitting talking to a whole bunch of old school kind of gamers, right? People who've been gaming since the seventies and eighties. And one of the things, actually, Todd Bunn, who we've had on the show before, pointed out is he's like, you know, I love Judges Guild products now, but when they came out, I thought they were horrible because you couldn't understand what was going on. It wasn't until I had the time to really take it apart or talk to other people who would run it that I began to understand just how well-written some of these Judges Guild modules were. Um, and my experience is the same way. I think uh, like G1 against the, you know, the, the steading of the giant uh, um, you know, is a great adventure. It's, it's a great module, but it's poorly designed because there's just too much information on that page for you to understand. Um, and, it, and, it, and it takes a lot of notes and everything. And so this is this is something where puzzles, traps, and things like this all benefit from clarity of writing and clarity of design. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and making notes and providing information so the judge doesn't have to have a degree in bioengineering, right? So they can understand what's going on um, is really critical. And so... Right. so presenting your material the right way is just as important as writing the right material. Yeah. And I think a, a key part of that, um, like you say, you know, you don't, the judge shouldn't have to have such and such background. Keep no. that in mind. Yes. As you're writing your product that particularly if you're talking about a puzzle or an interaction with an NPC or whatever, there may be an aspect of that, that, um, that seems obvious to you, but understand that uh, not everyone who buys the product will necessarily find it obvious. So, so lean on the side of more explanation of, for the sake of the, the judge who's, who's reading the adventure of um, what the implications are. Um, one final thing that I want to, to, to touch on before we wrap would be um, the, well, okay. <laughs> One A, uh, we've we've talked about this many times. In fact, we've had a whole uh, uh, episode on it. Play test, play test, play test. Um, both for a level of difficulty, time, uh, how long the, the time takes, and also loopholes that you didn't recognize. I don't think we need to dwell on that. I think we we've we've dealt with that at length. Um, but I want to talk just briefly about the notion of uh, open ended challenges. Not every challenge in an adventure needs to have a, a solution that you specifically 
uh, map out. One of the neatest games that I ever played in was a very high level game. The GM came up with this scenario. Uh, all right. Um, we were, we're diplomatic people in this area and we find out there's a certain intelligent creature that's being uh, hunted and eaten as a delicacy. And we have to bring that, we have to stop that, but without just going in and, and killing things, killing people, because there's this delicate diplomatic thing going on. And he said, after we wrapped it all up, he said, I said, what did you uh, expect that we were going to do? Cause I came up with a solution that nobody saw coming. And he said, I didn't have something in mind. I just presented a difficult situation and I, I knew that you guys would, I would just and put it out there and I figured you guys would come up with something. And, you know, there are some, um, uh, there, are, there are some uh, times where you can present a challenge in an adventure and just have it be there. And, uh, and maybe what I, and what I've done a couple of times is in things I've written is I've said, here's a couple of ways they might get around the, or deal with this and solve it. And here's how that ought to play out. But then just leave it as um, there doesn't have to be a specific way that oh, this is how it gets solved. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Ed. I think that um, that giving people some open-ended ways out, especially when you get back to like traps and puzzles, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, magic is a real thing in Dungeon Crawl Classics, and there are a lot of spells, and they're really well-defined, and they're really well-developed. And uh, one of the things that uh, that um, I talked about with an editor at one point for one of my adventures, actually for that first sandbox setting, House of the Petrified Frog, is um, we put in a section for each encounter puzzle trap, which was, you know, this spell could undo this. This spell could do could do this to this, right? Mm -hmm. So we went and looked at the, the list of spells that people were likely to have and had to think about it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So... So you need to be able to anticipate lots of things. And, and that brings me to my last point mm -hmm. on this topic for today, because we're running out of time. And that is, I think as a writer, the most invaluable tool you can have is to have a group of very close friends who can critically review what you've written. After you've slaughtered them, right? You then give them the manuscript and let and and then have a let them read it and have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how helpful it has been for me to have a group of good friends who are willing to tell me I'm when I'm when it, when something's BS and say Trevor that's poorly written or I I wouldn't have read that that way. You need to rephrase this. You know if if what if what actually happened in the game was what you intended, then this is poorly done, right? And and have them have them confront me on it and tell and you know and I and I hold no no ill will. That's exactly what I need sometimes mm -hmm. is to be told that wonderful writing that you did is horrible and, <laughs> and you need to rewrite it. <laughs> you um, totally agree. Yep. Yeah, so I, I, I would leave it with that because we're running out of time and, um, and everything, but uh, yeah, yeah. Get some friends, make sure they're critical, make sure they're not just yay sayers, right? Everything you do is gold. Let them tell you what's wrong with it. And let them tell you how they would have run a scenario after you run it for them. Yeah, preferably people who have experience with being a GM. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so, yeah. All right. So, folks, we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for joining us for the Scrivenery. Yep. Bye-bye. Have a great night, everybody.